Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the WRS seminar series. Our speaker today is Casey Runquist, and she's doing a master's degree in water resources science. Um, her advisor advisors are Dr. Lucy Levers and Amit Pradhanga, uh, Pradhananga. And uh, she works a lot on the uh, public values of invasive species. And I think she's going to be talking about some of her research today. So I'll turn it over to you, Casey, and uh, very honored to have you here uh, as one of our very active members of the WRS Graduate Student Committee. All right. Well, thank you, David. Um, I've got to make sure I share my screen correctly here because I was struggling earlier. All right. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? Oops. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, as David mentioned, um, I've been working uh, with a research team on public values of aquatic invasive species. And so I've actually done um, two different kind of components to that, which we'll get into here shortly. Um, and yeah, I'm advised by Dr. Lucy Levers in the Water Resource Center and Dr. Amit Pradhananga in the Center for Changing Landscapes. So as uh, many of you probably know, there's a lot of complexity in managing surface water. It's very interdisciplinary. There are many stakeholders involved. Um, there's local, state, federal, international level. And so um, the fact that surface water management is that complex just kind of reflects that the different components of surface water management can be as well. And one of those components is aquatic invasive species which is kind of the area that I will be talking about today for both of my chapters. So, oops, I don't know why that's not working. There we go. All right, so um, as you guys think about what factors can influence phosphorus levels over here, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the common carp so it's an aquatic invasive species that was intentionally introduced in 1877. And um, because it's a very large fish and highly fecund, it can, uh, it's, it's pretty well adapted in the United States. It can be found in 49 of 50 states. And then in Minnesota, 77 of 80 watershed districts have common carps. So, um, and then we have phosphorus over here. And so as many of you probably know, phosphorus can be uh, affected by seasonality or phosphorus levels, I should say in lakes. Let me clarify that. And so, um, yeah, there's many different things that can influence it. And so while phosphorus is an essential element in overabundance, of course, it can be uh, negative to water systems and aquatic systems. So um, one thing I wanted to explore further was this relationship between common carp and phosphorus. And um, so there's been conflicts in the literature uh, as to what exactly the effect is. Some of this is due to the scale that these uh, experiments in this research is conducted it because there's been lab experiments there's been um mesocosm experiments there's not been many a whole lake experiments yet there's a little bit of literature out there on that and so um yeah so i just want to explore that relationship further and so that's what we did so just a little bit of background um, there are several different mechanisms as to why common carp can increase phosphorus levels. Bioturbation is one of them. It's pretty commonly established. It's probably the most well known. And it happens when um, the, generally when carp are feeding because they burrow at the bottom of the lake and they stir up uh, all the sediment. And so additionally, 
it's been uh, kind of theorized that excretion rates and decomposition rates of carp also contribute to total phosphorus level increases and fluctuations. This is largely due to the metabolic theory of ecology, basically stating that because a carp is larger and uh, is a bigger fish, it has more excretion. And when it decomposes, more phosphorus is released from its tissues because it absorbs so much when it's alive. So those are kind of the uh, ideas and theories as to how carp can contribute to phosphorus levels. You can see here how big this fish is. Um, that's my little five-year-old nephew, just for like a point of size reference. And then my brother here, he is not a small guy, but you can see it's like almost half his height. So um, they actually hopped in the water down by this dam to get it because they couldn't net it. So that was kind of an interesting experience. Um, so as I refer to carp management throughout the duration of this presentation, um, these are some of the strategies I'll be referring to. So I think these three are relatively self-explanatory, but um, drawdown, for those of you who may not know, is the physical action of actually like drawing down the water lake, lake levels. And typically this is done uh, to restart growth. Uh, it can be done for various different reasons. But um, for common carp, it's done to eliminate the population, essentially. And then rotenone is a treatment that it's, it's a natural chemical that's used to uh, kill off large populations of carp. So anytime I refer to management strategies, this is kind of uh, those types of things I'm talking about. This um, it depends on your watershed district, your lake, uh, your body of water, and those types of things. Those uh, determine best management strategies. So um, to collect data, we, I, or yeah, I did um, phone surveys with different watershed managing agencies across the state. And so I talked to, oops, getting ahead of myself, talked to some watershed management organizations. Um, these are required in the seven county metro area of Minnesota. I talked to watershed districts in Minnesota and um, these two water management agencies had the most, uh, I guess experience isn't maybe quite the right word, but they are the ones who manage uh, CARP more frequently than any of these other agencies because it's kind of, I guess, more so in their purview. And so I got a lot of uh, CARP data from these or ah, there we go again from these sources and uh, it, such as management strategies, years of management, and those types of things. And then I also collected total phosphorus data. And for that, I mainly use the MPCA database, so the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I also uh, was in contact with someone from Ramsey County who provided me some total phosphorus measurements. And then um, the Met Council, who typically uses like citizen uh, measurements. So if anyone out there is a citizen measurement taker, thank you. Um, but yeah, so I use those three sources to gather most of my total phosphorus data as well. So, this slide that just keep wanting to pop up. So um, we had three general criteria for a lake to be included. Um, there had to be an initial carp biomass of over 100 kilograms per hectare. I forgot to mention this earlier, but that is the threshold in which common carp become damaging. So that's kind of just been like well, pretty well established. Um, and so we kind of use that guideline then, uh, my computer. Anyway, so we kind of use that guideline as like our standard. So if a lake had over 100 kilograms per hectare of carp and then it was substantially reduced after management, then it met one of our criteria. 
we also needed to have that biomass data available. Um, it be, I noticed like a common trend that biomass data isn't necessarily either kept or collected. I would venture to guess it's because of costs associated with it, but I'm not entirely sure. And then we also needed total phosphorus uh, measurement data. The time frame in which we were looking for was about 2000 to 2019. And so, um, yeah, so we were looking for total phosphorus data in that time frame. Um, amazingly, the MPCA database actually has, or Minnesota Public Pollution Control Agency has a fair amount of data prior to 2000. So that was quite impressive to me, or so I thought. Um, so we started with about 75 lakes. And then after we s saw which lakes would meet this criteria, um, it narrowed us down to about 10. So you can see down here, we have the lakes um, organized from shallowest to deepest. And then um, the green indicates total phosphorus levels before management and the yellow indicates total phosphorus levels after management. So um, to calculate the total phosphorus before management, what I did was I took, uh, I went to the MPCA database or my council or whatever my data sources were and collected a monthly average for each month of the summer from May through September. And then I averaged that out to create a summer average. And then I had a summer average for every year leading up to management and including management. And then for TP after measurements, it was the same type of process where I used the um, monthly averages to create a yearly averages to create an average number. So um, we also have biomass measurements here and the biomass before, uh, because the, there's not much biomass data available, the biomass before data is the closest measurement to the management year. So like this could uh, have been a couple years before management actually occurred. This particular case was not, but, um, and then same thing for biomass after. I didn't take averages of the biomasses. It was just the closest available measurement after management had occurred. And so you can see here, like some of the trends and such, but I just want to point out that of um, in Lake Lucy, there's actually a slight phosphorus increase, which was kind of interesting to see. So um, some of the results. So before we even did any analysis, we wanted to calculate the percent change in phosphorus for before and after management. So we use this formula and you can see that in all of these um, lakes, except again for Lucy, that there was a reduction in phosphorus, which is pretty neat. But then we wanted to see which of these reductions were statistically significant. And so we ran a t-test to look at the TP before average, the mean of that compared to the TP after. And so you can see here that in Casey, Pickerel, Howard, and Starring, that there were significant differences. I also want to um, point out here that Pickerel is the only lake that's not in the. Okay, Pickerel is the only lake that's not in the North Central Hardwood Forest Eco Region, actually in the Western Region. And so the only difference that really makes is the acceptable amount of total phosphorus levels for different uses. Um, so yeah, so these are just kind of the results. I, and one more note I want to make, uh, Coleman, Keller, and Jarvis, though they are kind of different water bodies, we, they were included as one management chain. So the biomass measurements used for these were actually all the same, but the TP levels or total phosphorus measurements were different. 
So um, some conclusions here. It seems from this subset of lakes that there's some evidence to suggest that uh, carp could influence phosphorus levels, specifically in shallow lakes, since the, they were all under a depth of 15 feet. And then additional total phosphorus and biomass measurements would be advantageous for lake managers. So those are kind of the conclusions that I think are the biggest that stood out from this study. So now before we go on to the next part, um, just kind of want to remind you guys. So we just discussed the carp phosphorus relationship and then um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and we're going to talk a little more about environmental psychology and human dimensions. And just remember that this all ties into surface water management. They're both important components in this very interdisciplinary process. So um, one of our questions with uh, uh, this environmental psychology side of the field was we wanted to see uh, if, if values can help predict boater behavior. And so just kind of a little bit of background here. So we all know some pro-environmental behaviors and probably do them without even realizing it, like recycling or composting or riding a bike or walking instead of driving. So there are a bunch of different great pro-environmental behaviors out there. Uh, but we're focused on uh, environmental behaviors regarding aquatic invasive species. And so that was kind of, I'll get some more in depth here with the methodology, but that was what our survey focused on. And so there are some influences to um, this pro-environmental behavior. So as you can see here, attitudes, norms, culture. Uh, and then you can see that I put this as a line, but then wrote not a linear process, which you know would typically seem silly. But I just really want to point out and kind of uh, give credit to. So the initial thought behind uh, what affects behavior was kind of more of this linear process. And it basically stated that the more knowledge, the more behavior change. Well, of course, that has uh, been proven for the most part not true, though knowledge still is an important component to behavior change there's not this linear relationship. But without some of these initial linear uh, theories that existed, then we wouldn't have got to where we are today with the cognitive hierarchy theory, which shows it serves generally as a template for behavior change. And it's more of a pyramid type of um, theory. And we'll, we'll get a little more in depth here. So, um, as most of you probably know, boats can serve as one of the main vectors for aquatic invasive species. You can see here, I attempted to make some zebra mussels, but for those of you who know my artistic skills, you can see that they didn't quite turn out. So, but you can see kind of just how boats serve as vectors. Pr makes sense. Um, so I'm going to refer to boating behavior throughout the next several slides. And when I say boating behavior, I mean these six actions. Of course, it can mean a bunch of different things, but this is specifically what I mean. Um, there's, a, there's required boating behavior in Minnesota before you launch your boat or before you take it out. And that is in visually inspecting your boat, removing plants and animals on your boat that are maybe stuck to it or on the trailer draining the water from your boat and motor and bilge pump and live well, and then avoiding the release of unwanted bait. So those are required. And then what's recommended is to rinse your boat and to dry your boat. And they're, again, they're not requ required, but they are recommended. So, um, so to gather that information, we conducted on-site surveys in the summer of 2019, and we did so at four different lakes. Um, so I had a team of trained undergraduates, and we 
had altering time blocks and altering days of the weeks. Um, I can go more into detail of that later if anyone wants, but that's kind of how that setup was. And so we sat at these public access points here, here, and indicated by the purple dots. And we would ask recreationists if they'd take our survey and then the survey gathered information about the behaviors people are partaking in, values, socio-demographic, and then willingness to pay uh, factors, which I'm not focused, I haven't done much with that, but it's important to note because the survey was kind of um, built a little bit around that in the lake selection process more so because we wanted an infested and uninfested lake. So Gull Lake is infested with zebra mussels and Pokegama is not. Coronis is infested with starry stonewort, but Minnewaska is not. And so the variables that I'm really focusing on and paying attention to are boating behavior. So the six that I mentioned, and then if they completed it or not. And then also risk, perception of problem, uh, reasons that people visit lakes or the ecosystem services they provide, and then values that people hold. So um, just going a little bit into risk here, risk is commonly used to help predict behavior. Um, it, it's one of the influences, I guess, in the cognitive hierarchy theory that can help to determine behavior. So you can see here, um, we asked these six, or we asked this question, how much of a risk do you believe AIS are to the following? And then the recreationists had these six answers in front of them, and then they had the option of no risk at all, slight risk, moderate risk, high risk, and extreme risk. And so they could only choose one of those per question but they didn't have to answer all questions. And then, so for perception of problem, um, we're curious to see if people were aware of aquatic invasive species in the state at the different boat docks and public access points we're at. And so we want, we want to use that variable um, because even though knowledge doesn't necessarily translate into behavior, uh, knowledge and awareness is one component that is important. So we also asked about values. So the question in front of the recreationist that was launching their boat would be, how important is it to you to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species for the following values or uses? So I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll highlight the ones in the results that are maybe more significant, but just like the previous one, it said not, not at all important, slightly, moderately, very, and extremely, and they could choose one of those answers per question listed here. And then um, the last uh, variable we wanted to use to help predict voter behavior is uh, reasons that people are there at the lake. So just like the last couple, they're presented with this list of reasons and they could choose uh, if it was slightly important, moderately important, extremely important. And so those, I'll go over these a little more in depth when we get into the results. But um, this was the question that was asked um, below is a list of possible reasons why people visit lakes. How important are the following to your experience today? So we're gonna, that's also another factor that could help us predict voter behavior. So just kind of to recap before we go into the results. Um, so we have voter behavior, that's what we're trying to predict. And we are using these different values to try to predict this voter behavior. So the perception of problem, that one was pretty easy, pretty simple. It's to what extent do you believe AIS are problem in Minnesota? So it was the only question, so it was the only variable. For values, it was um, that list of 10 that I will go over a little more in depth. 
for reasons in ecosystem services, it was that list of eight. And then for risk, um, we had the six questions, to what extent do you believe aquatic invasive species pose a risk to, and it was habitat and some of those other ones. And we created two additional variables. We created total risk score and uh, mean risk score as well to see if there was any significant difference that way. Um, I also want to point out I intentionally made this a triangle shape just to kind of uh, bring it all together to remember that with the cognitive hierarchy theory, it is not a linear process. It is a bunch of different components that, that are brought together. So um, here are kind of some of the results that we saw just uh, for those who completed boater behavior. So you can see that most people completed visual inspection plant removal and uh, animal removal. Sorry, I forgot to include that. So it's like any little mussels or anything that could be on there. Um, and draining water from the boat. So since most people completed those in the end value of those who didn't is very small, I'm not really gonna focus on that today. However, um, these ones have larger end values. So this will be a little more of the focus. So the recreationists, when they're asked, did you avoid the release of unwanted bait today? They could say yes or no. And just kind of to um, give that a little more context, I guess. So especially in Minnesota, I'm not sure what it's like nationally. You can't just like let your bait go into the lake, like if it's a minnow or something, and you can't take that water from the lake out of the lake to your home with a bait bucket or something. You either have to dump it out or you have to um, add some filtered water from like a bottle or something. So that's kind of what that's asking is if, if you let bait back into the lake or not type of thing. And so this orientation may be kind of confusing, but for me, it made sense in my brain. So um, for, those who completed, or for those who avoided the release of unwanted bait into the lake, so for those of them who completed the behavior, oops, there we go, all right, the, um, this was their mean score of if they were there to socialize. So if you remember, the um, score values are from zero to four. And for those who were not there to socialize, um, this was their, or for those who didn't avoid release of bait, they uh, valued socialization more basically. So for these two, for those who completed avoiding release of bait um, in, into the water, so for those of people, people that discarded their bait or um, properly uh, drained the water and such, they uh, valued wild rice, the ability to har harvest wild rice more, and they valued more high quality recreational opportunities. Um, I just, for the next two slides too, I just have this listed below in case um, the question, you can't remember the question because uh, there are a few different variables going on there. So that's just kind of what that's there. Uh, you'll see it in the next two slides. All right, so for boat rinsing, so for all of these, that they're statistically significant. And you can see that for all of these, those who did not rinse their boat valued these different things less than those who did rinse their boat. So um, it's, it seems that those who completed the behavior had a higher placement on values, specifically these ones at a, at a significant level. And then it's similar for dry, people who dried their boat. So for those who dried their boat, they had a, they placed more or they place more value on these different things up here than those who did not. 
Um, so that was kind of interesting to see that boat rinse and boat dry had uh, a fair amount of different values that seemed to be statistically significant, uh, especially comparatively to the voiding bait release, which is the required behavior. So um, just kind of some results to put it into word form. Um, well, first of all, since my advisor always does this to me in presentations, I'm going to point out that's my advisor when we got our first survey respondents. So um, yeah, we had a fun time though. We, we enjoyed doing the surveys and for me it was nice because I got to go back to Western Minnesota, which is where I'm from. But anyway, so the results, um, most recreationists completed three of the four required behaviors which was very encouraging to see. I did not know that that would be the case. I was slightly pleasantly surprised. And there was a small end value for those who did not complete those behaviors. So uh, just a reminder, visual inspection, draining water from your boat, and uh, removal of plants and animals, those are the three that I'm referring to here. And then, um, it was also interesting because there was no statistically significant difference in means of risk of the, the risk scores or the question um, AIS as a problem. Um, so I guess breaking that down a little bit, those who completed a behavior versus those who did not for any of the behaviors, there is no diff statistical significant difference in risk scores or awareness of AIS, um, which again, kind of makes sense because it, it's uh, kind of more of a pyramid where there's lots of contributing factors. So that I guess in that way, it kind of was interesting. And uh, values that seem to be uh, really good indicators to help predict voter behavior um, are, those, are the ones where, uh, to be able to harvest wild rice. It, they're asked, how important is that to you? That was a question. So to be able to harvest, wa harvest wild rice and for high quality recreation. So for those two values on avoid, on the boater behavior of avoiding release of unwanted bait, boat rinsing and boat drying, they're significant on all three. So that was kind of interesting to see. Um, I also want to point out this boat <laughs> when we were doing our surveys on Gull Lake, this guy put like an airplane engine in the boat and, but he couldn't drive it because the engine was too big for the boat. So I was just confused, but you know, teach his own. Um, so kind of some summary or a summary for this. So both relationships, total phosphorus and carp and values predicting boater behavior both seem to have some significance and would be worth further exploring. And then also um, these two studies are very important in water resource science. And I think they really highlight the collaboration that is there and the collaboration that we need some more of to be able to effectively manage uh, aquatic invasive species and then at a higher level manage surface water. So I, I think those are some really key important takeaways. Um, also, apparently I also thought there was more. Anyways, so <laughs> there are a lot of directions we can still go with the data that we currently have and just even using the same variables. So that could be interesting to further explore. And then also just remembering how dynamic and complex that surface water management is and just making sure to like always keep that in mind as we try to work as a state and country and even at an individual level to try and improve surface water. So that's my works cited page. Um, I'd like to thank my advisors, Lucy and Amit, and my committee members, Prashemik and Brent, and then all of my family and friends that joined to watch. So with that, I'll take any questions. Maybe.
Thank you, Casey. That was really a great presentation. Um, I guess I'll start off just to break the ice. <clears throat> Please, David. Is there a specific, uh, you know, score on the survey of, of attitudes <clears throat> that you would um, estimate is necessary in order to protect lakes? Like, you know, if you got a, a score of two, is that low? Or if you got a score of four, is that enough to protect a lake? That's um, kind of what I'm asking. Which specific, which attitudes were you thinking, like the values or the reasons people go to lakes or? Yeah, I mean, just take the values, for example. Okay, yeah, so like, I don't know that there's necessarily a specific threshold because, I mean, keeping in mind the whole complex of the cognitive hierarchy theory, there's many additional factors that can also contribute to change in person's behavior. But um, I definitely think it's important to have like, uh, I mean, values are so important and influenced by so many different things. I think it'd be really hard to put a numerical value on it. Casey, let me ask um, kind of similar to what Dave was talking about. So for these these values, and I know you showed the, the difference between the means, but were, was the spread much different? Um, like the the standard deviation of of the individual like scores of the group. So like the average was like two. So like between moderately and very important. What, what was it like a tight grouping? Were they all around there? Or was it kind of like evenly distributed? Um. I think it was a little more evenly distributed. Um, I guess I'm not really sure. Off the top of my head, that's, I mean, yeah. <laughs> hi. Um, hey, did Sammy. the, hi. Uh, did, um, people, I get, normally when I go places, I see signs about, uh, aquatic invasive species. Um, yeah. did, did you get people like referencing those Did people like see, um, seem to be like aware of them and reading what's on boards and like, so, you know, around them? Yeah. Just speaking personally from when I was out there, not like any data or anything we collected, it did not seem like people were super aware that these signs existed. I think I had one person pointed out and then he answered the questions correctly and kept going. So <laughs> I, it seemed like uh, people were not super aware of the signs at least. Okay, so um, can you like, do you feel like anything in your work can tell you about like where people are getting their information from? And I guess how that would play into it? So I don't know that we had anything in the survey that specifically addressed where they got their information from. It's more so what they know and how much they like care about certain aspects. I, I don't know that our survey has anything that would capture that. Casey, can you go to the slide that where you had the um, the p values for the um, the p values for the values? Yes. So um, I since I arranged them by like boat behavior, is boat rinse okay? Um, actually, I was looking for the one that had. I think. Uh, it, it, it was one. the one that said that people who went out there to socialize were less likely to do the um, behavior, but people who are cared about ricing were, yeah, this one. Okay. Um, so this was interesting, right? So if you're there to socialize, you have an opposite impact from these other two things. Mm -hmm. um, and so was this all the other values um, 
for avoiding the release, they, they were all, there wasn't any significant difference between the averages. These are the only three that had a significant difference. Yeah, at a 95% level. Okay. So um, what about even without the 95% level, were any of them um, similar to the socializing where they actually caused a, a decrease in completing the behavior? Um, off the top of my head, I do not remember. I know there was at least one that uh, there, there was like a positive mean difference, but I cannot remember which one that was. And just like the demographics of these people, and maybe you mentioned it and I, I missed it, but what were these people all kind of like the same or were they different kinds of people or what? Yeah, so um, I, th I think was it 97% of people were white, 50, I think it was a little over 50 were male. And then most were like roughly middle-aged. Okay. And what about, do you remember like, was there an education thing or? Yeah, we had, I mean, we had the education question. I don't remember though. And what about between the different lakes? Were there any difference between the people really at the different lakes or were they all pretty much homogenous? I'd say they're pretty homogenous. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just asking because there could be, Right, some of those those differences between people could drive some of this too. But if your if your population is fairly homogenous, it's good in the sense that it, it means that the things that you're testing are more likely to be the drivers of the differences, right? <laughs> but that is kind of interesting. So these are higher than I thought. Them two to three is what what did two to three? What do these numbers mean again? Uh, which. Like the score of two versus three, what does that mean verbally? Oh, I gotta minimize this here. I don't know what I just did. Um, so two, uh, in this case, like to socialize, how important is that to you? Uh, two would be moderately important, whereas three is very important, and four is extremely important. Okay. Interesting. Also gonna point out some of my undergrads here, maybe. Or I don't know where my mouse just went. But they're in the top left corner. Uh, we had some fun. We went canoeing on the Mississippi River, did some other fun things. So um, on the phosphorus in the lakes and the carp results? Yes. It seemed like the uh, lake phosphorus was improving in so, most lakes. Um, I, I think in Lucy is the only one where phosphorus levels increase after carp management. And so I do want to point out, um, we have this 0 0.05 level here, and we have some of these lakes that are exceeding it, of course, by a little bit, some by a lot, some not at all. But um, 0 0.05 is roughly the phosphorus range for the North Central Hardwood Forest uh, eco region. And so the only lake that's not in there is Pickerel, and actually the range for phosphorus is even higher for um, the Western Corn Belt Plain ecoregion. So I, I think we saw mostly a decrease in percentage of phosphorus change, but though not all of them were significant. There's a note from Doug Jensen uh, in the chat. So it's about uh, survey information on sources boaters and anglers use for their information. So oh. anybody who's interested in that, please follow up. Could you repeat what that said again, David? I can't find my chat. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the note says, if interested, Minnesota Sea Grant has survey info that shows what sources boaters and anglers get their information as well as the best sources for them. Okay. Uh, the number one source is signs. 
So anyway, that's what the text message in the chat said. Okay, thanks, David. Casey, these lakes that had uh, significant differences, so you said that they were shallow, but did you mention what type of management strategies seem to be the most effective? Yeah, so I, I didn't list them here, um, but it seemed like drawdown management strategy was probably the most effective. It occurred in Casey and in Picaro, and I believe in Howard as well. So it seems like that was probably the most effective one. Some of these also had like different management strategies co-occurring. So um, it would be kind of hard to conclusively say, but it seems like Drawdown was probably one of the top ones. Is there any um, evidence that any of those strategies actually remove phosphorus on their own? Yeah, so I mean, the goal of drawdown is to kind of restart the ecosystem and, well, it can be the goal, I should say, depending on uh, what you're trying to do. So then by taking the lake level down, um, it it's easier to like dredge and maybe remove some of that phosphorus. So yeah, there are some of these that uh, could also remove phosphorus just by themselves. Casey, uh, Jill Sweet here. Um, so just curious, hi. <laughs> um, I know it definitely seems like there's some, you know, corresponding here with the removal with depth, for sure. You know, the shallow lakes are seeing better improvement in, in lowering phosphorus. Have you looked at any other differences in just the lakes themselves? Uh, that's kind of something that, that I'm interested in, you know, what are the, what are the other differences? Um, littoral area, size of lake, uh, kind of different composition. Um, and how that might affect affect things. Yeah, I mean, I've looked a little bit at some. I had some additional um, parameters in this graph that I cut out last minute because it was really large. <laughs> but um, I, like here, you can kind of see water clarity of the 10 year average. Um, I pulled that straight from the MPCA website. And so um, it seems like, yeah, of course, at lower water clarity than it there seems to be more significance of uh, phosphorus removal um, in those lakes. And then we have the max depth here uh, going from shallowest to deepest. I also included the surface area and acres. And then um, I've looked a little bit at the like TSI scores specifically for total phosphorus, but I haven't looked too much to like observe any patterns or see anything like that. For sure, because you know, for us, we were kind of going in, we have a lot of lakes that were managing carp, um, some shallow, we're expecting to see changes, and then a lot of deep lakes where we're not necessarily expecting to see super significant um, improvements in the water quality just from removing carp. Mm -hmm. But again, they're you know, it's just there's not been as that much research on specifically deep lakes and carp management. So, you know, Wasserman specifically, the lake I'm kind of focusing on has a super huge littoral area. So, you know, it's a little like, is that going to, is carp going to be more of a drive around that lake um, yeah. than other deep lakes? So, I can't remember, is Wasserman, it's like 50 feet deep? Yeah, yep, it's uh, 41 feet deep, uh, but 70% of the lake is, is littoral and kind of the shape of it has some really big shelves of the littoral area, so. Okay. I'm excited but, to see the presentation next week. Yeah, as I say, I can give away a little bit of the results. We're not seeing drastic water quality improvements, so. <laughs> <laughs> it, it falls, it goes, it goes along with your, your research here, so. Thank you. Well, I think you broke the record uh, for the best attendance at the <laughs> WRS seminar for this semester at least. So congratulations and uh, let's everybody give you a virtual hand and did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. <laughs>